ओम ज्ञानतिरंधस्य ज्ञानांजनिशलाकाय चक्षोरुन्मिल तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नमा ओम विष्णुपदा कृष्ण प्रस्था भौतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी इति नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातिदेशिणे वाचाकलतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो निनंद श्रीअद्वैतगदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम रामा हरे 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 कृष्णा सो आई विल स्पीक टुडे ऑन द पास्ट टाइम ऑफ प्रकाशानंद सरस्वती एंड आई विल बी यूजिंग अ पावर पॉइंट एंड आई विल फोकस ऑन अ कपल ऑफ वैल्यूज फ्रॉम दैट पास्ट टाइम primarily the values of humility and sensitivity which we learned from that past time so this is in the madhya leela the chetan charitamrut has 25 chapters in its madhya leela that's the longest section of chetan charitamrut there are 20 chapters in the ante leela and there are 17 in the adi leela so this past time of so prakashan so his past time is actually distributed it primarily his interaction happens in the 25th chapter the focus is on him but there are there are district references to him earlier also in mahaprabhu is in varanasi so mahaprabhu actually is in varanasi he goes to vrindavan and then he comes back the madhya leela is primarily mahaprabhu's travels his travel from first from mayapur to puri after taking sanyas then he stay in puri for some time then his south indian tour he goes all the way down from the indian coast up till he comes to pandrapur in maharashtra and then he goes down again and then after that he stays in puri where the rathyatra festival is described and then so if you consider 25 chapters of the madhya leela the <coughs> chapter 1 and 2 describe mahaprabhu's initial travel to chantipur and his stay over there then chapters 3 4 5 they are largely describing his travel uh, to puri uh, to to puri and then his six six chapter describes his interactions around bhattacharya and so that is so he stays very shortly in in jagannath in jagannath puri but he does something dramatic he transforms the biggest scholar over there and immediately leaves it is as we stay to rest on his laurels so chapter 7 Uh, describes his travel across south india chapter 8 is his encounter his discussion with ramanand rai beautiful profound discussion then chapter 9 describes his further travels and then chapter 10 describes his return so then 11 12 13 th, uh, chapters are rath yatra the gundicha past time and other things chapter 14 15 describe a few other past times in in uh, jagannath puri then there are three chapters which describe mahaprabhu's travel to vrindavan He he plans to travel. He actually uh, travels and then he reaches Vrindavan. Then so as, as I'm saying, it's mostly travels. The 19th chapter describes his uh, broadly speaking his interaction with Rupa Goswami and his instructions to Rupa Goswami. But that's only one part of it. There is a lot described about how the Goswamis re, uh, 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 get themselves free from the uh, from the service of Nawab Hussain Shah. And then 20th chapter. Two twenty-four chapter are describing his instruction Sanatan Goswami. So then twenty-fifth chapter is describing his uh, his transformation of Prakashan Saraswati. So this is a quick overview. So it's mostly travels, and in between travel there are many deep philosophical discussions and sweet devotional interactions. So in the Prakashan Saraswati pastime, uh, what exactly happens? So. there are multiple phases to this past time and incidentally this past time is also described in the adi leela where philosophically mahaprabhu's position is being established in chapter 
and there how he he challenged and converted the biggest philosopher at those times that is ma that is uh, prakashan saraswati that is described over there so his name was prakash anand saraswati but what did mahaprabhu do it is only after he uh, was enlightened by mahaprabhu that he truly understood what is prakash what is anand and what is the blessing of saraswati so actually mahaprabhu fulfilled the import of his name so that uh, transformation that philosophical convers- conversion is described in the uh, adi lila and in one sense in the anta lila the im- sorry in the madhya lila last chapter 25th chapter the impact is described the impact means how amazingly prakash sarasthi was transformed this person who was a champion of advaita vad he what has he done he has actually now his championing vaishnavism and even his disciples are championing uh, mahaprabhu's teachings bhakti kaurya bhakti so that's a dramatic transformation so just to get a sense of how glorious was his achievement we need to understand what was the position of uh, of varanasi at those times varanasi is, was like the intellectual headquarters of advaita vad prabhupad said that varanasi is the vrindavan of the mayavadis what he meant by that is just like vrindavan is the we could say advance the capital of devotion so that is their capital that is their headquarters so Uh, mahaprabhu that makes mahaprabhu's accomplishment even more re- remarkable it like say a, now say there are arch rivals in india and pakistan are arch cri- rivals in cricket so if uh, india and pakistan ha- have a match in india and india defeats them there okay you defeated on the home territory uh, the world cup in australia and india defeated them there okay it's a neutral territory but if india goes to pakistan and defeats them in pakistan that is extraordinary you know, to go in the opponent territory and defeat them there so mahaprabhu is going to the headquarters of the opponent and defeating them there defeating him there so it's it's that remarkable and so how did mahaprabhu achieve this we say mahaprabhu is so great in philosophy his philosophical acumen is so brilliant that nobody could challenge him. he would certainly be uh, he would certainly be victorious yes but if we start ascribing everything to mahaprabhu is omniscient he is god he can he can speak to anyone and everyone and he can he is wiser than everyone because he is omniscient is yes, that could be one way of looking at it but then there's nothing we can much we can learn from it if you want to learn from the past times we have to see what mahaprabhu is doing and see what 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 can the lessons we apply from it so it is going to be difficult for us to ever for most of us to or for any of us for that matter to come to the level of philosophical erudition that mahaprabhu has so does that mean that we can't uh, we can't do outreach to influential people we we will not be successful unless we are that that scholarly no scholarship was only one part of mahaprabhu's you uh, could say repertoire his arsenal what all weapons he used what all resources he drew upon But he captured their hearts with his humility and his sensitivity so let's try to look at this and these two virtues are what we will discuss today and we'll see how we can apply these two virtues in our own life also so let's begin and uh, i'll be using a powerpoint over here to illustrate these virtues of humility and sensitivity so let's start so first of all what is humility some people in the corporate world especially they feel if you are humble everybody will walk on top walk over you you cannot be humble you have to be assertive so humility you could say humility means the humility is a profound concept and i am just approaching it from one perspective one way of understanding humility is it means to not let our ego 
come in the way of our purpose not let our ego come in the way of our purpose what does it mean that means say prabhupad when he was in india he india was still a pious country and prabhupad was respected as a sanyasi and especially vrindavan he was respected as quite a dedicated devout sanyasi in contrast when prabhupad left that to go to america what happened was prabhupad nobody knew him he was a strange old man before he was going to america sumti maharaj told his sponsor she told him swami ji if you want to speak bhagavatam you come to my house every day i'll hear bhagavatam from you and she was respectful she was earnest but prabhupad didn't want that kind of ritual hearing of the bhagavatam if prabhupad had simply been concerned about his ego how much am i being respected he would actually have been respected more in india at least initially as compared to america nobody cared for him he had to actually struggle to find where i want to stay a uh, when one of his accomplices one of his associates he attacked him and he had to run out and he had to ask people can you arrange some for me to stay here so prabhupad when he was staying with uh, some lower east side initially they had no idea of his exalted stature so when they had to use the restroom that they would all form a queue and the prabhupad would stand in the queue so prabhupad would say that you know, i am where is my respect but prabhupad saw these people are spiritually receptive so he focused on that purpose so okay if i am disrespected okay it doesn't matter but i'll focus on that purpose they are spiritual because after they are hearing about krishna then i will focus on that so let's try to understand humility from this perspective a little bit more if we pursue our purpose for boosting our ego then that's not humility that means if i speak about krishna and i am concerned how many people are coming for my program how many people are appreciating me how people are glorifying me But then what will happen is that is that is lacking in humility if i'm simply doing a service to boost my ego but on the other hand if i think if i speak about krishna then uh people will think i am a great preacher a great speaker great scholar and then i'll become proud and therefore i will never speak about krishna Now we can't give up our purpose in the name of not having ego. So what do we need to do? We need to put aside respect and disrespect considerations for fulfilling our purpose. If I am respected, and if that respect helps me to reach out with Krishna's message to others, that's wonderful. But sometimes some some audience may be not of not being respectful in one sense, but they are actually seriously inquisitive. They ask difficult questions. and by humbly carefully logically answering the questions actually we may do greater service so we put aside respect disrespect considerations to focus on our purpose that is humility so humility is not uh, not devaluing ourselves it is valuing our purpose more than our 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 ego that is the essence of humility we could say let's see how Mahaprabhu, during his Prakashan Sar interaction with Prakashan Saraswati, demonstrates this particular virtue. So his humility in Varanasi, how he demonstrates humility. So one aspect of humility is that we are so concerned with our ego that if we are not respected, we just give up. So Mahaprabhu, did he do that? Initially, when Mahaprabhu came to Varanasi and he was dance performing Hari Ram Sankirtan, and people were getting attracted. So the Maya Vadi Sanyasi says. this is not the duty of a sanyasi a sanyasi is meant to study vedanta why is he not coming and discussing vedanta with us he is but dancing on the streets like a sentimentalist is a less intelligent person so when he was being disrespected like this there was a maharashtrian brahmin who had met mahaprabhu and he was very captivated by mahaprabhu's effulgence mahaprabhu's devotion mahaprabhu's ecstasy mahaprabhu's beauty Uh, uh, so, but then he uh, then he went and met the sannyasis because they were very respected in in Varanasi. They were like the you could say the intellectual rulers of Varanasi. And so when he heard them criticizing Mahaprabhu, he felt very hurt, and he came back and reported to Mahaprabhu. So Mahaprabhu said, "If you people don't respect me, why should I stay here? I'll just leave." Oh, he didn't do like that. 
He said, I have to share Krishna Bhakti. There is that famous vision where Mahaprabhu says, I have brought so many fruits, but nobody is wanting them. What should I do now? So he's, he wants, he's, he says, I want to distribute these fruits. So even if people are reluctant, I want to distribute these fruits. That was Mahaprabhu's uh, focus. On the other hand, Mahaprabhu didn't go to the other extreme. And he didn't say that, oh, these are so respected sannyasis, they are scholars. At that time in medieval India, Advaita Vad was as influential intellectually as science is in today's world. If somebody says, oh, you are unscientific, most people who hear this will just intellectually dismiss this, such a person. So like that, oh, you are not Advaitic, uh, you, are, you are intellectually worthless. So that was the level of respect that Advaitic San, Advaita Vad had and Advaitic Sannyasis also had. So they are so respected, they are so expert. So if I contradict them, if I say, oh, the way the, the teaching of Vedanta is not Advaita Vad, it is, it is Bhakti. He says, won't, I, won't it be arrogant for me? How can I be arrogant like that? So Mahaprabhu didn't think like that. Why? So it, he was not concerned about his, his ego, whether I may whether I may come off as arrogant. No, he was focused on his purpose, and that's why when finally, uh, initially Mahaprabhu didn't want to meet the Advaitic sannyasis, but the Maharashtrian Brahmin he felt that these sannyasis they are not understanding Mahaprabhu, so he wanted to arrange somehow a meeting between them and Mahaprabhu. So he's, he arranged to invite them to his house and he then begged Mahaprabhu, please come and visit my house. And Mahaprabhu understood what was going on, but he appreciated the heart of that Maharashtrian Brahmin and he said, yes, I'll come. So he came there. And then when he, all the sannyasis were sitting and Mahaprabhu arrived, instead of, you know, sometimes in elite assemblies, people are very conscious of what is the seat given to them. Oh, I have do if I am a special guest, do I have a set seat on the on the stage or not? Okay, if not on the stage, I am a VIP. I should at least be in the first row. So sometimes this kind of uh, uh, in especially among influential people or famous people, they are very conscious of of the seating arrangements. So the the Vishwa Hindu Parishad one time tried to unite all the Hindu groups and they arranged a conference. But then what they tried to do was they tried to they said all the traditional traditional uh, traditional Hindu groups say the Shringeri Mat and to some extent uh, the Shri Vaishnavism or Madhva Vaishnavism some of the groups from uh, Varanasi they gave all them front seats and the other spiritual teachers, say those who are famous in India, whether it be whether it be the, all of you know the popular spiritual teachers in today's world in the last one or two decades. So those those who are quite popular, they put them in second, third, fourth rows. And after half a day, most of these influential spiritual teachers left, and they said, you know, "Okay, all these traditional groups might be there, but we are we are having more followers today." And if you don't give us a due respect, why well, are we here? And that whole, whole attempt to unite Hinduism didn't work. Because what happened was that the traditional, traditional forms of Hinduism don't necessarily have the uh, traditional teachers belonging to traditional forms of Hinduism don't necessarily have the wide, widest reach today. The popular teachers of Hinduism are often uh, people who don't have much affiliation with uh, the tra any of the traditions. Formal affiliation, as at least. So anyway, the point is that who sits in what position is considered very important by people. But Mahaprabhu, he he didn't consider, oh, all of you are sitting, I want a seat right in the middle, I want a prominent seat. He actually sat down at the very place where, who sits, where, where, the place where people would wash their, wash their feet, he went and sat near that place. The idea is there is, a, there is a place for sitting over there for the person who would, who would offer water for washing other people's feet. So that's basically like a servant. So Mahaprabhu sat in that position. 
and in this way he demonstrated that the mood of no dasa dasa anudasa now why did he do that now he was he was captivatingly attracted mahaprabhu is bhagwan and Brahm, brahmano hi pratishtaham the brahman comes from bhagwan so the advaitavadis were attracted to brahman they could actually see the brahman effulgence coming from mahaprabhu and they said oh the sanyasi is so effulgent and he is sitting in such a low position so that humility was what softened their hearts and they said oh no why are you sitting mahode why are you sitting here please come and sit with us mahaprabhu said no i am okay only no no please come and sit with us and they themselves they got up and they came to mahaprabhu and they offered mahaprabhu a helping hand they led him and they brought him to a seat over there so what did mahaprabhu do by this he opened their head and heart to his message and that's what enable that's how he was able to eventually uh, transform them so Mah- that is his humility humility means to put aside our ego so that we can focus on our purpose so this is how mahaprabhu demonstrated humility now how did he demonstrate sensitivity if we want to consider what does sensitivity mean sensitivity means we need to be aware of others emotions and the impact of our emotions of our actions on their emotions that means if we are speaking some words if we are doing some actions how is it affecting we need to be aware of that and then the willingness to modify our actions for avoiding unnecessary negative responses and for eliciting desirable positive responses so what what happens when we are sensitive in this way we make people emotionally comfortable so that they can hear the spiritual message when prabhupad was uh, in, uh, invited for a college program in europe so that time there were a lot of uh, influence of radical left uh, communism in uh, the st- among the students and they were they were all about power asymmetry and uh, power differentials so the devotees were arranging a big a big asan for prabhupad on the stage and the students started clamoring why are you sitting on this top big stage or big seat why do you need that big seat prabhupad tried to reasonably explain but they were just not able to hear and after that program got over prabhupad told his followers next time you organize a program don't have such a big such a asan for me. just have a simple chair so prabhupad's focus was not on whether i have asan or not focus his focus was on whether i am able to transmit the message or not so okay if this asan is triggering some negative emotion among people there's no need for the asan so that is sensitivity so when we are sensitive what happens we are able to reach out to people so what is mahaprabhu sensitivity sensitivity means to understand as i said to understand how people will react to certain things so that was a time when many people would react negatively to somebody from the bhakti tradition i tell you you must be a sentimentalist and advaitavadi they would respect a lot so what mahaprabhu did is mahaprabhu actually took sanyas from advaita sampradaya just so that people would have a positive emotional reaction when they would meet him for the first time oh okay He said, "He said, 'This one that way, some pradai. Oh, okay, must be a great sannyasi.' And then he also offered respect to those who were respectable in society's eyes. Now, this we you know Mahaprabhu spoke strongly about, say, Maya Vadi Krishna Pradhi, Maya Vada Bhasha Shunile Hale Sarvanash. He spoke all those things, but that that those who are Maya Vadi, they are offenders of Krishna. That those who here mayavad will be destroyed but mahaprabhu didn't speak any of these when he was actually interacting with the mayavadis he was very respectful to them why because they were sanyasis they were respectable in their own right and mahaprabhu afforded them uh, uh, accorded them offered them the due respect so that was a sensitivity if the disres- if he had disrespected them that would have triggered a negative emotional reaction and he would not have been able to speak that message itself any message to them he would not have been able to have a discussion the sensitivity means to not trigger negative emotions unnecessarily in people so why does sensitivity matter if we are not sensitive then we make it difficult for others to hear us 
to focus on our message so instead of we becoming the channel for the message we become the uh, obstacle for the message the way we are talking prevents uh, people from hearing what we are speaking so what do i mean by this say let's consider some words like say the word cult prabhupad uses that word quite often the cult of shri mahaprabhu is spreading all over the world now and today's world for most people as soon as they hear the word cult they are thinking oh this is a very insular group of indoctrinated people who are being manipulated and who are doing maybe even doing terrible things anti social criminal things so nobody wants to be a part of a cult today during prabhupad's times the word cult basically meant a group actually even in 1960s the word cult had started having a negative connotation but when prabhupad learned his english in 1920s at that time the word cult had a fairly positive connotation so or at least a neutral descriptive connotation basically just it meant a group of people but today when we know that uh, cult has a negative connotation so prabhupad used that word so i'll use that word no if that word has negative connotation there is no need to unnecessarily alienate people so just speak what is suitable for them use use the word group use the word group use the word uh, tradition now what is the word tradition is quite respected this is what religion may not be as much respected but this is what my tradition teaches we we'll accept that you know i i i am a part of this tradition so saying i have joined this cult so yeah i i am a part of this tradition oh okay nice Let's see. So let's understand this. Why sensitivity matters? So being insensitive means suppose we are giving a class to people who live in who are habituated to warm weather, to a hot climate. Suppose in the Middle East somewhere, and there we decrease the temperature of the room to around ten degrees Celsius or twelve degrees Celsius. They are habituated to twenty-five or thirty degrees temperature, and they are so physically uncomfortable. Say, I don't care. I am speaking about Krishna. Well, but. people are so physically uncomfortable that they can't hear about krishna so just as we don't want people to be physically uncomfortable similarly we don't want people to be emotionally uncomfortable and if we have to do some adjustments for that that's that's actually just being sensible we enabling us to focus on the essence and enabling us to help people focus on the essence so mahaprabhu demonstrated sensitivity time and time again now we have that when shrikant sen who was uh, the nephew of shivanand sen shrikant sen once got very upset because nityanand prabhu dealt with shivanand sen in a way that he felt was very disrespectful and he just all the devotees were coming from mayapur to puri and shivanand sen just came straight uh, they were shrikant sen just left that whole group and came ahead and when he came ahead and met mahaprabhu he offered obeisances but he was so disturbed that he forgot to take out his upper vastra upper cloth that is the convention in those times that when you uh, especially um, specifically for males when they are offering their respects to a venerable person they remove their upper cloth but he forgot to do that so mahaprabhu servant was pointing out hey remove your upper cloth and mahaprabhu said don't don't disturb him he's already disturbed so it is not that Shri Kant said he was always violating the rules. Now at that time he was disturbed. Mahaprabhu said, "Don't trouble him further. Don't disturb him further." So that is Mahaprabhu being sensitive. Now Prabhupada himself was actually we think of Prabhupada as strong and uncompromising and sharp speaking. Yes, that is true. But that was not the only aspect of Shri Prabhupada. Prabhupada was actually aware of how his words were. affect people and he was sensitive and he didn't uh, provoke people unnecessarily so prabhupada was expert in evoking positive emotional reactions from people if that would help them in serving krishna so when he was in india he would tell his indian audiences that this message of the bhagavad gita is from india and india uh, but what is the situation today i have to get people from america to teach india's message to indians this is your message so learn it and share it with all over all over the world there are so many people who are hungry for this message thirsty for this knowledge 
So now somebody could say that actually the Bhagavad Gita is spiritual knowledge. India is just a bodily conception. Why? Why is Prabhupada perpetuating bodily conception? No, Prabhupada was triggering the national cultural pride the, and the positive emotion that comes from that, and using that to engage people in, this, in Krishna's service. So sensitivity, basically, we could say means means is engaging people's and emotional energy in bhakti, ensuring that people's emotions help them come close to Krishna and don't push them away from Krishna. So, so now. This is, as I said, Prabhupada. Prabhupada was strong and uncompromising, but Prabhupada was daksha more than that. He was expert. So strong speaking, we may say Prabhupada would not Prabhupada wanted us to be sensitive. Prabhupada wanted us to be strong. And yes, we speak strongly, but what is strong speaking? Strong speaking is not about how loud, how loud is the volume of our speech, or how judgmental are the words coming from our mouths. Strong speaking is about You're losing your voice. Maybe internet or really just now you lost or constantly you have been losing. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, Prabhu. Okay. So you are seeing the PowerPoint also? Yes, yes, Prabhu. So I was saying that strong speaking doesn't just mean depend on the volume of our voice or the judgmentality of the con judgmentality of the content of our speech. Strong speaking is about how strongly what we speak attracts people toward Krishna. If our strong speaking ends up repelling people from Krishna, then we are simply defeating Prabhupada's purpose. We may be quoting Prabhupada, we may claim that we are following Prabhupada, but we are actually defeating Prabhupada's purpose. So here. I'll just talk a few points about how Prabhupada was also wanted us to be humble and sensitive in outreach. So this is somewhat long but very important quote. Uh, I'll read through it and then I'll elaborate on a few points in it. So Prabhupada is saying, Now I want that we shall recruit more and more our men amongst the intelligent class of men. Because they are a little educated or they have got some wealth or fame or ability, so they will be sometimes a little puffed up. But that is all right. They deserve it. It's amazing. They are puffed up, Prabhupada, and then they are Maya. You see, they deserve it. And, and that is all right. Now we shall have to learn the art how to approach such higher class of men and attract them to apply ourselves to this Krishna consciousness process of self-realization. Prabhupada is not saying that they are ignorant, ignorant, go and enlighten them. Prabhupada says, we have to learn the art, not that we have the knowledge, we just give it to them. No, we have to learn the art of how to approach. What is that? Just go and speak to them. You are ignorant and I am enlightened, I am going to enlighten them. No, learn the art of how to approach them, Prabhupada is saying. And then that requires much tact. It's amazing. There is strong speaking and there is tactful speaking. So Prabhupada says much tact is required. That requires much tact. And we shall have to expect to meet all challenges by sharp minds. So, Prabhupada is not saying, oh, they are ignorant and they are arrogant and that's why they are arguing. They are sharp people. And they are making challenges. We have to prepare to meet their challenges. And then further, so this is the letter to Balwan, December 13, 1972. But if we remain always absorbed in remembering Lord Chaitanya, how he converted so many intelligent men even sitting for three days and nights to hear them speak without himself speaking anything. This is referring to Mahaprabhu hearing uh, from Sarum Bhattacharya and eventually converting him, transforming him. And if you remember how Krishna was so much patient to explain everything to Arjun, even Arjuna was speaking like a fool. So this is Arjun almost, uh, you know, the entire first chapter of Krishna doesn't speak at all. And Krishna hears Arjun. So in this way, being always tolerant of others and appreciating their points of view. This is another amazing point. They are in Maya, they are, they are ignorant. No, we appreciate their points of view. No, I have the truth. Scripture is truth, everybody is wrong. No, Prabhupada is not saying, appreciate their point of view. It will be easy. If we do this, it will be easy matter for us to convince them gradually to join us. 
So here, Prabhupada is recommending tactfulness, respectfulness, appreciation, tolerance. So what is going on over here? This is, you see, this is a very different Prabhupada from what I have heard about. Well, no, Prabhupada is far bigger than our conception of Prabhupada. And we, we, can, we, always, we may know a lot about Srila Prabhupada, but there is so much more for us to know about him. So to, uh, one way to understand what Prabhupada is saying over here is about re respecting uh, people who are, who are achievers, we can say, in the world, who are VIPs or celebrities. We can, we can expand our understanding of God consciousness. God consciousness or Krishna consciousness. What does it mean? See, when we interact with people, we, we say we should see people from a spiritual perspective, from the Krishna conscious perspective. So quite often what we do is, we often our, see what they are doing or not doing in relationship with God. What does that mean? Oh, you know, these people eat meat? Terrible! Oh, this person has, a, has impersonal conception? That's offense to Krishna. So, we focus primarily on what they are doing in relationship with God. But actually, another very important aspect of God consciousness is, of Krishna consciousness is, seeing what God is doing in their lives? How is Krishna acting in their lives? What does that mean? That they may not have any relationship with Krishna, but Krishna still has a relationship with them. Krishna is still present as the Paramatma in their hearts. Sarvasya chahamrudhi zanya vishtu. He says, I am in the hearts of everyone. Krishna says, surudam sarva bhutanam. He says that I am the well-wisher of all living beings. So that means that Krishna is acting in their lives. So if they have attained some success in their lives, if they have attained some fame, that is, that is also the grace of Krishna. Without that, how could they have attained it? So we see how, uh, how Krishna is acting in their lives. And yes, they may have got some wisdom, they have got some, some virtues, some, some skills, and we see that this is all Krishna acting in their lives, Krishna making some arrangements, Krishna blessing them. So if we focus on that, then it is easier for us to see how we can connect them further with Krishna. And uh, so when Prabhupada went to America, he could have just focused on the fact, oh, these people are breaking all the four regulative principles. In fact, we could say their regulative principle was to break all regulative principles. But Prabhupada didn't focus on that. Prabhupada focused on, oh, Prabhupada said, Krishna has sent all of you to me. To assist me in my Guru Maharaj, in my service to my Guru Maharaj. So, what is Prabhupada saying? What is Krishna doing in their lives, not what they are doing? And uh, now, of course, we can see what people are, how people are acting, but focus on how Krishna is acting in their lives. And you know, if we try to acquire this vision, every interaction with everyone can actually become an exercise in Krishna consciousness. Okay, you know. What spark of spirituality is, uh, is slightly even active in this person? What kind of wisdom they have, which can connect them, which can make them receptive to spiritual wisdom? So it becomes a, it becomes a journey in discovery when we try to focus on how God is acting in these people's lives. So with this understanding of Krishna consciousness, let's try to appreciate the quote of Prabhupada. And Prabhupada is saying they deserve to be puffed up. What does he mean by that? So, we need to respect people for what they have achieved and what they have achieved in their terms. See, we may say, oh, all our material achievements are just Kamala uh, Dalajala, Jima Talmal. They are just temporary. Okay, they are temporary, but achieving them, they requires talent, requires commitment. So, if people have that, if it were that simple, everybody would be great achievers. Why do some people become achievers? Because you may say that's just because of their destiny. Well, that means they worked hard and did good karma in their previous life. And it's not just previous karma, life's karma. Many people may have talent, but not everybody who has talent is able to transform that into achievement. Because many people don't have commitment. So, that is also to be considered. So, we need to appreciate them. And more importantly, what we have to see is not just what they are doing again, what Krishna is doing in their lives. So if they have some special ability, if somebody is a great cricketer, somebody is a great, uh, even a movie star, somebody is an author, they may not be doing anything in relationship with Krishna, but they have special abilities in their particular field. 
So Krishna says, Paurusham Nurushu, I am ability in people. So that we need to say this is Krishna's Krishna manifesting as the special ability of this person. Our Krishna says that everyone's opulence is a spark of my splendor. Yad yad vibhuti mat sattvam, Shri Madhurjitam eva va tatta deva va gachatvam, Mamate Jomsha Sambhava. So Mamate Jomsha Sambhava, Krishna says. That means if somebody has fame, somebody has power, somebody has uh, knowledge, even if it would be material knowledge, but those, those things are sparks of Krishna's splendor. So we see how Krishna is acting in their lives, how Krishna is giving them these opulences. Now they may not be using those opulences to come toward Krishna. That's okay. But Krishna has given them those opulences. So we can think, we can appreciate, that can also be include our Krishna conscious vision. And uh, then we can say, okay, how can these abilities, these opulences they have, how can I connect them with Krishna? How can I help them come closer to Krishna through this? George Harrison had singing ability and Prabhupada said, write songs and sing songs about Krishna. So oh, Prabhupada did not say, oh, you are such a, no, it's all illusion. Prabhupada didn't say that. Since you have been given ability, use it in Krishna's service. The second point is, learn the heart of how to approach such higher class of men. What does this mean? Learn the art. So Prabhupada is saying, just because we are right, or just because we know what is right, doesn't mean we know the right way to present it. So what does this mean again? I have the truth. Okay, I have Shastric knowledge. Okay, fine. But how can I present it in a way that these people can understand? Some of us, we may think that Prabhupada's example of how to, say, uh, share spiritual knowledge with scientists is how Prabhupada spoke in Life Comes From Life. Actually, mm. Swaroop Damodar Maharaj, he asked Prabhupada specifically. He was there, he was the main person in this conversation of Life Comes From Life. But he asked Prabhupada before the first scientific conference that he organized in 1976, he said, Prabhupada, you are so strong and cutting when you speak about a scientist. So in our interaction with scientists, will you want us to speak like that? Prabhupada said, no. You be polite, you be respectful, you be courteous, you be perfect gentleman. And he said, you speak my points in their language. So their language. So scientists have their language, their terminology, their way of presenting. So we need to present in that language. And that's why Prabhupada said, Bhaktivan Institute was a specialized institute for doing not just scientific outreach, actually the purpose was all kinds of intellectual outreach. So, normally we think of uh, language as a means of communication. But actually language is also a mode of thinking. That means different people think in different ways. So, a person born in, uh, say, the 21st century will think very differently from a person who was, uh, say, living in the 19th century or the 15th century or even a person who was born in the 19th, uh, 20th century, second half. So different people just have different languages. They have different ways of thinking. So learn me, learn the probe. What does it mean? You need to talk with people. Not just talk to them or talk at them. Talk to them means, you know, that talk down to them. Oh, I know I'm enlightened, you are ignorant. Uh, no, talk with them. Okay, if we speak something, what? how do you understand this? If they're not able to understand, then we understand how they are thinking and then we adapt our presentation accordingly. And the last point is appreciating their points of view. This is amazing. You may say, from the Shastri point of view, you are wrong. Well, okay. What Prabhupada is saying here is appreciate their point of view. Don't just judge their point of view from our perspective. Uh, understand why they think the way they do. Don't evaluate their thoughts, understand their thinking. So Mahaprabhu actually, he knew Advaitavad, he knew how Advaitavadis think, thought, and that's how he was able to, especially with say Sarum Bhattacharya, he, he heard Sarum Bhattacharya's explanation, and then he pointed out to Sarum Bhattacharya how his explanation of Vedanta Sutra was inadequate. And then he explained how a more coherent expression of Vedanta Sutra came from a personalist perspective. And he was able to persuade him. So don't evaluate their thoughts. Understand their thinking. 
you know, this is atheist, this is materialist, this is mayavadi. Okay, that's uh, okay. You may we may value it, but more important is why do you think like this? Understand their thinking. Once we understand their thinking, then we can say within their thinking, how can I reach out to people? So, uh, sometimes we say, let's get to know the background of people. For some people, getting to know somebody's background means basically digging up dirt on them, salacious leaning. Oh, you you are such a you think you are such an advanced devotee now, but I know what you did at that time and that time and that time. So that's like uh, finding the skeletons in people's cupboards. But actually, to understand people's background means to understand what is on their back and to understand what is under their ground. What does that mean? That means if something else on our back that will burden us. So every different people have different burdens. So somebody may have been associated with some religious group where uh, they were they were cheated or they were manipulated, and that burdens them when they come to Krishna. So those experiences burden them. Then we have to understand. Just because somebody is asking difficult questions or having a lot of doubts doesn't mean that that gives us the right to say you are samshay atma and you are vinashati. You are going to be destroyed. Na I am loko sti na parona sukam samshay atma na. You are going to be miserable in this life, and you are going to be even more miserable in the next life when you go to hell. We don't have any right to speak to anyone like that. Understand their background. Understand the what is on their back, and what is under their ground. Under their ground means some people have deep rooted insecurities, fears, because of maybe the way of their upbringing or their life experiences. And such people may be very closed. That doesn't make them necessarily uh, spiritually, uh, spiritually hostile or negative. Well, they may need some special attention. So appreciate their points of view. When we do this, then we can actually reach out to people much more effectively. Now, what about not compromising? What about uh, speaking strongly? Yes, they are also important. So I'll conclude. with one slide which is the balance of the two things so effective speech this is based on 7.17.15 in the bhagavad gita anudvega karam vakyam satyam priyahitam jayat so krishna says speak satya but also speak priya hmm? speak the, what is hita but also speak what is anudvega kar so so i am putting these as sensitive and sensible sensitive is that which doesn't agitate people's mind that which pleases that which is pleasing and uh, sensible is that which is satyam that is truthful and that is hitam that is beneficial so we need to be sensitive and sensible if we are only sensitive but not sensible then what happens then we are like doctors we are like a doctor who doesn't give injection to a child because the child says oh i'll feel too much pain and the doctor thinks oh the child will feel so much pain how can i give them injection and we just uh, don't the doctor doesn't give the injection that would be sentimental doctor has to do that you the doctor should can't care so much for the child's present feelings as to not care for the child's future where the disease will become worse if the injection is not given so we don't be so sensitive as to stop being sensible But at the same time we can't just say i'm being sensible and i will only be sensitive that is like what suppose a doctor is going to do a surgery and that surgeon says i won't give you anesthesia i don't have time for that i just do cut, cut the body of the person oh, the patient will have to go through unbearable pain and it will be very very difficult for them so the doctor gives anesthesia then the patient can go through the surgery better otherwise the patient will just jump off of the bed push the doctor away and run away neither is the patient cure nor the doctor has done the service so in a so we 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 say actually i am speaking the truth and it is for your benefit but the way you are speaking the truth it is causing me so much agitation i don't want to hear from you i am going to go away so we may say i am caring for your future but if we don't care for people's present feelings the way our words are impacting them right now then we will actually end up uh, alienating them so what does anesthesia injection in this context mean but sometimes we may have to speak unpalatable truths and what does anesthesia in this context mean it means that humility sensitivity 
it means developing a warm relationship so within that warm relationship when we give the light of truth people will be much more receptive to it in the early days of shri prabhupad's movement prabhupad was giving the light of truth but his accent was such that many of his early days followers couldn't even understand what he was saying but what they could very well understand was the warmth of his personality he cared for people he paid attention to every one of them he gave time to whoever wanted so they were touched by that and then even if prabhupad challenged some of their conceptions counter countered their misconceptions they could take it because the that light of truth was given within the warmth of the relationship the surgery was done after doing anesthesia so humility and sensitivity in this context enable us to do the give the anesthesia by which in, we develop a warm relationship and then we can do the surgery of removing people's misconceptions that's what mahaprabhu did with prakashanand saraswati and that's what we can also try to do in our interactions with people especially influential people if you want to bring them closer to krishna so i'll summarize i spoke broadly four points today first i started with what is humility to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose and explain how mahaprabhu demonstrated that humility in varanasi then second was tolerance sorry not tolerance uh, sensitivity that means be aware of others emotions and adjust our behavior to elicit positive emotional responses from them so we discussed how mahaprabhu was sensitive and throughout what is been discussing prabhupad example of prabhupad being sensitive also so that was the uh, it was humility and sensitivity were the first two parts and third part was prabhupad's quote and its explanation that we need uh, we need to learn the art of uh, reaching out to a higher class of intelligent people they are puffed up they deserve it and we need to appreciate their point of view also so god consciousness doesn't means to see what people are doing in relationship with god it also means to see how god is acting in their lives so we can just see this person is puffed up because they are in maya all their opulences are also maya no their opulences are krishna's vibhuti krishna is acting in their life and has given them this so we appreciate that and then we see how can this be connected with krishna and then uh learning art the art means the learning of art art of how to approach them that means that we don't just speak at people or to people we speak with them we understand where they are coming from so that we can uh, we can connect with them and appreciate their points of view doesn't mean that we say that everything that they say is right but it means uh, rather than just eva- evaluating their thoughts we try to understand their thinking to know their background to know what is on their back what is under their ground then within their current way of thinking we can bring them closer to krishna and lastly i talked about 1715 in the gita the balance the balance of sensitivity and sensibility is what will bring effectivity to our speech thank you very much hare krishna thank you so much chaitanya charan prabhu for giving a wonderful presentation completely different perspective so thank you so much devotee devotees anyone has questions looks like amrita prabhu has question go ahead amrita prabhu Hare Krishna Prabhu ji please accept my humble obeisance all glories to Shila Prabhu pad thank you very much prabhu that was very insightful and so many practical trips yare de katara kaho krishna upadesh that's the instruction but how to do it you really clarified it prabhu the sensible and sensibility uh, what what i'm considering is basically its relationship with people you need to have a relationship and when you have a relationship then it is something which is not palatable uh, the other person is open to listening rather than just us coming and giving him and justifying that oh because prabhu pat said this or because shastra said this i'm right but in relationship prabhu it takes time to build and many a times there are situations like uh, uh meeting with the public book distribution or if you're doing class or something like that it may not be one on one it's just general so how do we maintain this sensibility and sensitivity so that the message becomes absorbed yeah, taken exactly. well 
yeah that's a, it's not a it's not easy but two three things we could do is if even if we are speaking in a public audience uh, maybe we can get to know the audience by ask talking with the organizers trying to understand from the organizers okay what kind of people are coming what are their concerns now so generally spending some time with those who are organizing the program those who know the audience that is one way that is helpful very helpful uh, second is that especially if uh, a particular area is our area of service is our guru datta desh we can say if say we are trying to reach out to managers if we are trying out to reach out to engineers if we are trying to reach out to say uh, doctors or particular class of people then maybe spending some time to understand that demographic maybe read something about them maybe uh, if there are some devotees in that community spend some time with those devotees learn from them that is helpful when prabhupada was in america uh, he in when he was initially in the house of sally and gopal agarwal he actually so, 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 in battle of pennsylvania so sally agarwal in her memory she says that swami ji was so eager to know everything about america he wanted to know how the american how the laundry works so, sorry how, how the vacuum cleaner works you know how to put the mm. money in that machine so that the laundry gets done over there how the supermarket works Uh, so now did prabhupad go to america to learn all these things no but prabhupad wanted to understand how the american mind works so because he was in america so he spent that time so first is ask the organizer second is uh, if we are focusing on a particular audience then spend time in that uh, trying to understand the demographic and third would be uh, try to when this is difficult especially when we are having virtual speaking real speaking but uh, in general if we can see the audience then try to understand what is the, what which point the audience listens to attentively which point turns off the audience and uh, some way sometimes time may not allow it but doing some kind of interactions uh, maybe in between also to see ask do some kind of reflections giving the audience time to speak somewhere that also helps those are some broad things i can say okay thank you very much Thank you. So many uh, thank you for your thoughtful question. So many of the points which I have spoken in today's class mm-hmm. I have written articles on my website Gita Daily. Gita Daily is a website where I write every day an article on the Gita. There are more than 4000 articles there. So I am sending links to some of the articles which some of you may find helpful uh for understanding how to if you want to know read more about what we have discussed today we find this helpful thank you any other questions or comments i think you you have already in one sense delayed so i don't want to stretch further shall we stop here shanam pro namantro yes, looks like there are no further questions yes Thanks madhupati so okay madhupati pro my all pranam to you also धन्यवाद प्रणाम प्रभु जी हरी हरी थैंक यू वेरी मच होप यू आर डूइंग वेल या या डूइंग वेल थैंक यू थैंक यू हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा जय श्री प्रभुपाद जय वैष्णवृंद की जय महाप्रभु की जय गौरभक्तवृंद की जय चैतन्य थैंक यू सो मच प्रभु हरे कृष्ण धन्यवाद राधे राधे थैंक यू